Um, th good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning. It's my great pleasure to introduce you our speaker today, Dr. K.R. Sridhar. He's the founder and CEO of Bloom Energy, which is a company founded in 2001, led by a vision to really change how the world generates and consumes energy. He's the visionary behind Bloombox. K.R. and, Bloom, uh, and Bloom have led the world of clean tech in many uh, important ways, and um, I'll just take a minute to mention a few notables for both KR and Bloom. So KR was named by Time Magazine as, te as a, a tech pioneer who's going to change your life. Fortune Magazine also recognized KR by citing him as one of the top five futurists inventing tomorrow today. World Economic Forum also named him as a tech pioneer in 2010. Bloom under KR leadership was really, I mean, it, talk about being a pioneer, uh, was, was the first clean tech company to be funded by Kleiner Perkins. They developed and commercialized what we now know as Bloombox, and its customer, uh, customer list is pretty extensive, includes uh, many notables like Coca-Cola, eBay, Google, Walmart, HP Pavilion, and, and others, just to name a few. And while KR is not a life science person and not, not a life science name, I think there are a lot of parallels and commonalities between clean tech and life science that I think will, um, will be able to glean from KR, what KR has to share with us today. Life science and clean tech both um, have the potential to be really game changing and to be life changing. And both of them really have long lead times and are pretty capital intensive um, efforts. And in order for these endeavors to be really game changing, I think they both require state, uh, commitment uh, to the vision of what can be and a leader who's committed to getting there. And I think KR is really just that person. Prior to founding Bloom Energy, he was an academic. He was director of the Space Technologies Laboratory at the University of Arizona, where he was a professor of aerospace and mechanical engineering. And under his leadership, STL won several nationally competitive contracts to conduct research and development for Mars exploration and flight experiments to Mars. Currently, he serves as an advisor, and he, he served at the time as an advisor to NASA and led many consortia of industry, academia, and national labs. He's worked for the NASA Mars program to convert Martian atmospheric gases to oxygen for propulsion and life support was recognized by Fortune magazine, among many others. KR currently serves as a strategic limited partner at Kleiner Perkins and as a special advisor to NEA. He's also served on many technical committees, panels, and advisory boards, and has many uh, numerous publications and patents. KR received his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering with honors from University of Madras in India, as well as his master's and doctorate in engineering and mechanical engineering from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm really looking forward to hearing KR talk today. He's a thoughtful, visionary inventor, entrepreneur, and leader. He also, you know, it's, as you can hear, you, as you can tell by uh, his, his bio, he made the transition from being a very productive academic uh, uh, professor into the CEO of uh, his own startup. But even more remarkable, is that he founded this company about 15 years ago and continues to be the CEO of a company that now commercializes. Um, I've asked him to inspire and challenge us, and I'm sure he'll do just that and more. Please help me welcome K.R. Sridhar. You know, you know, just driving into the campus and walking out here and seeing the students uh, brings a lot of nostalgia for me. Uh, an academic environment is so stimulating. It's uh, it's wonderful, uh, and I want to talk about two things for sure. One is the transition from academia, whether you're a student, a postdoc, a faculty, if you're planning to go out and do something, uh, what that meant for me, what that journey was. It, it is anecdotal, it's one-off, but you know, uh, you know, maybe there are things that will be in common with whatever you plan to do. That's one. The other one, like June said, I think there is a lot of similarity between the two fields. Uh, I'm no expert. I don't know anything other than, thank God you all do what you do. So you're curing more and more diseases and making life healthy and more than curing diseases, preventing 
diseases in the first place using the things that you learn and do. Uh, but there's a lot of similarity between the kind of industry that we are trying to change and bring about an impact in the world and what you are all trying to do and bring an impact in the world. So those are two themes I definitely want to talk about. But it is your precious time. Uh, there are a lot of places I can go. I would love to get five, six, eight questions from you on things that you, you would like to hear me speak about. I'll bundle them up and then make sure that as I give you my story and narrative, I'm touching on those topics so it's relevant to you. Um, always the first question has some hesitancy. After that, people start throwing up. Any volunteer to throw a first question? I'll look for a chalkboard. Anything you want, you know, want to hear me talk about today? So I'll throw the first one out. So in terms of you know, clean tech, I, I, you know, a lot of people refer to what you do and what Bloom does as being the pioneers. What are some special challenges that you encountered as being the pioneers? And then what are some special privileges? OK. So the story of Bloom, I'd say, unique by being first, right? Mm -hmm. And what have we learned and what can be learned for others from that? OK. Ways in which you took money to craft partnerships and strategies. OK. So idea to market. Yeah, that's, that's what we want. Okay. The fun of having to deal with the legacy industry. Yeah. I'd be really interested in knowing how you personally learned, as an academic who probably knew little about lots of this, how you learned. Yeah. Yeah. So, academia to industry. Take, I can take a couple more and do justice. Yeah, Bruce, go ahead. a little bit variation of your fourth point, but uh, is there any specific experience that you had in academic life which triggered you to decide that you stop being an academician, which is much easier to maintain the inertia and change to become a, like a CEO of a company and run a company? Okay. Uh, so, side shoot of this would be um, some traits and attributes, right, that helped, that helped that. Thank yeah? I was interested in some lessons you might have about cross-sectionality, transportability of some of the things you've learned, in particular, and maybe in an intersection between clean tech and entrepreneurship. Sure. Sure. So. Clean tech to biotech. Yeah. All right. This is maybe a follow on, but um, where do you see the clean tech market going? Because I know it's challenging to um, get investment right now, and, and we do have some, some synthetic biology and biofuel research going on here. So. Yeah. So, funding. Funding and future of clean tech. Yeah? Okay. I think that's a good set. And when I'm done in about 30 minutes, we'll just look at it and see if I addressed everything. But it may not be in that sequential order, so I can tell a narrative. But I'll just start with that. So uh, if I just start with my story, uh, the academic life, actually, and the transition really goes to two parts. The first part that seems so obvious, I was an academic as a faculty and how that helped me with my trades. But I want to go one step back to my, even my graduate days and how that, as a graduate student, what I learned and how that helped towards that transition. Um, so it always starts for all of us with mentors. Okay? I can't say enough about mentors and mentorship. So I was doing my PhD. Uh, 
with a very well-known professor in my field, heat transfer, which is my area of expertise. And he was possibly one of the world's best uh, at that time living, uh, you know, heat transfer, uh, you know, faculty members. And that's what attracted me to go, you know, go to Illinois, work with him and do w what I needed to do. Like most grad students and most of us would do, I thought I was going to le learn the best of heat transfer from him and that's what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, I did. But looking back, what I learned from him that's helped me the most in life is not heat transfer. Uh, he taught me rigor. He taught me how to be rigorous in thinking and not to speed up and complete something. His famous line to me was, there's always enough time to do a lousy job. <laughs> okay, no matter what your list is. And it is about the rigor. And he taught that to me not by telling me that, you know, you know, telling me what to do. But I would give him, and at, you know, you know, those days, uh, pre-PC, so it, you know, we would handwrite it and somebody else would type it up. And, uh, but he would just mark everything up, every, every manuscript I gave to him for, you know, like, you know, like reports. We were working on funded research, so a lot of reporting. And how he would mark it up how he would think about it. He'd say, just don't make these corrections, think about it. And after I got it the first time, the second time, the second time was the last time I said, I'm going to get that kind of a marked up document back from him. It was, if he as a faculty, head of the department, one of the largest departments in the country for engineering at that time, could find the time to be that thoughtful and mark it up as much, why would I, a grad student who had nothing else to do other than that, not spend that time doing what I needed to do? And it brought about this pursuit for excellence. And excellence being your own bar. Every single day am I doing better than I did yesterday? Uh, and it's a journey and not a destination that you've achieved. And the moment you feel that you're, you're at the top is the day your mediocrity starts, okay? And so it's constantly, every single day, what can I learn? That, that curiosity to learn, the curiosity to get it right, uh, the curiosity to not compromise on the aspirations and learn that it's a journey. And you'll, you'll never at the end of the day be there, but that doesn't matter. Tomorrow's another day. Uh, that I learned, right? Going back to traits and attributes. Uh, the other thing that I learned from him was because he was the head of the department, he would interview. And uh, without mentioning names, there was this young guy who was extremely recruited from one of the top schools, came to Illinois to interview with him. And I had known him, and I was a grad student at this time, PhD student. So the, so, the, so the previous uh, night, he had gotten together with me and he also knew I worked for the head of the department. So he wanted to understand from me how this guy is, what, what he is. So I could see that he was full of himself. He, he felt like he was the gift of God to mankind. And you know, that's not unusual. I'm sure you all run through people like that every single day. And uh, so I, I just told him, he's a very thoughtful guy who's gonna cut right through. And you, you, know, you just need to be yourself and be able to explain why you can do this job. And he, after he came out of the meeting, I asked him, what happened? How did it go? He said, really badly. And I said, why? <laughs> and he said, he asked me a question nobody else has ever asked me before. And I had no answers. I was just blinking at him blank. I said, what did he ask? I kept telling him, everything I've accomplished and how accomplished I was. And I was showing him the number of papers I'd published, what I'd done. And he just looked at me and he said, so can you just summarize in a paragraph for me what all this work means to any impactful advancement for anybody in this world? And I'm just you know, asking you to speak. And he couldn't. So, at the core of it, and 
when I was ready to graduate and I went to him, and even before that, he would pull me aside and say, you're my last PhD student, I've done so many things, uh, I've seen so many students. You're somebody that should be thinking about making an impact. And don't be drawn into the cycle of how many papers are you going to publish, where it's going to get published, what that resume is going to look like. Ask yourself, how valuable is what you do? And at the end of the day, it'll always you know, do you good. And guess what? I came pretty darn close according to my, you know, according to my faculty, you know, colleagues by the time year four came saying, if you just continue at this rate, you may not get tenure because they were counting the number of papers and not what that meant. And I can tell you, I trusted him and his advice a lot more than anybody else did. And I said, doesn't matter. I'm going to keep doing what I needed to do. And what I was working on, which goes to the next thing, was I'd gone into doing space technology. I viewed Earth as a cradle or a crib. We are all, all of humanity to date is a little baby still living in the crib. One day we'll get out to other places. It's not if, it is when. And we can only do that if we learn to live off the land. Today we don't do space exploration. We do space hiking, space trekking. Hitchhikers and backpackers carry everything they want on their back. Explorers are people like Lewis and Clark. They burn the boat. They learn to live off the land, never look back. We don't do that in space. We are not space explorers. We are space hitchhikers. Okay? So that was a fundamental thing that I wanted to go figure out how to change. We don't know who was the first person who came up with the wheel, but we know how important it was. I wanted to be the first person making, making a resource that is of importance to human, being, uh, human beings using resources completely extraterrestrial. And what I did was a technology that produced oxygen on Mars using locally available resources and using sunlight available on Mars. So that experiment that flew on one of the robotic programs was the first time a molecule of something essential for human life was produced completely extraterrestrial. And that was my passion, that was my mission. And if that meant working on that passion and, and publishing a lot fewer papers, if that meant that I was not going to get tenure, I didn't care about the tenure. So it goes to, again, the attribute. Be passionate about what you want to do and stick with it. Understand why you're doing it and believe in it and stay with it. So uh, that was Mars. So if I was that passionate about Mars, then why did I leave it and go doing what I'm doing? Uh, very simple. The Federal Express trucks going to Mars were not stopping at my doorstep often enough. We were developing our technology a lot faster than the missions to Mars were happening. And uh, at this point, our lab was very well known thanks to the great students that we had and a team that we had. The lab was very well established. It was a pioneer in this kind of research. But, uh, and funding was abundant because we were one of the few people. And, uh, you know, uh, in other places when I say that, they don't appreciate that, but in this audience, I'm sure. <laughs> you can all appreciate that. Uh, after year five, I don't think I ever wrote a research proposal unless a program manager from one of the agencies came and convinced me why they had multi-year funding and why it was something that they could convince me of was of importance. So I was already shooed in for that and they told me, just write a proposal and give it to us and we'll fund you. But we only took on the really hard problems to solve. So funding was there. Everything was there. So why did I leave? The reason was very simple. Technology is like prepared food. It's got shelf life. Okay? 
tomorrow with everything else that's innovated around in the ecosystem. Whatever we do today will not be relevant. For the sake of publishing and saying I did something, if we cannot actually implement that technology into what that vision was of facilitating a human mission to Mars and facilitating human life on Mars, uh, the relevance of it from a high integrity perspective was we were spending a lot of money on things that may or may not get used. It didn't seem right. It just doesn't, didn't seem right. So we had won a $20 million contract uh, working uh, competitively against Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Johnson Space Center, and we, we won the $20 million contract to put a little device that, that would have used water and oxygen and air and CO2 from Martian atmosphere and actually germinated a seed. This is what we had. And that project was canned in terms of the FedEx truck not going to Mars. And so I said I'm returning the money and thinking about what I want to do next. Of course, my university administrators couldn't believe that they heard what I, what I said. They were ready to fall off, you know, figure out the overhead associated with that <laughs> money that they were not going to get. But it, it just didn't matter to me. It didn't seem right. So that's when I stopped and I said, what am I going to do next? And there, uh, again, I started with a clean uh, sheet of paper thinking about what can be the most impactful that I can do, going back to my advisor's advice and how I'm wired and what resonated for me. Uh, so what became obvious was three things, clean air, clean water, and clean energy are not going to be a fad. It is going to be something that we're going to need for the next 100 years of innovating and disrupting and doing what we need to do if, ten, if about 10 billion people need to live on this planet. Again, going back to my space roots, there's a beautiful picture of the uh, Voyager spacecraft that was sent out in the galaxy just exiting the solar system, looking back and taking a picture of a huge solar, uh, a huge solar system plus a little bit on the, on the periphery, full big black wall that, that is many, many times this backdrop. And one little pixel was a little blue pixel, and that's Earth, okay? That's the only place we know how human life as we know it can exist today. And having done the Mars mission, I can tell you, sustaining uh, life on Mars is very hard. It's much harder than making this planet more livable. Um, so I knew that these are three things that have significant impact. I like to joke that between that and the Martians not paying me good money, uh, <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was a pretty easy decision on what I wanted to focus on next. And while I was thinking through this, it was not whether I wanted to be an entrepreneur, whether I wanted to do anything. What's the big, next big problem with impact that I wanted to solve? And that led to saying that also while I was working on the Mars project, we had gone to the Atacama Desert, one of the driest regions of the, on the planet, and extracted enough water out of that very, very dry air. I mean, you can get static just by bringing two things close to each other. It's so dry. But we could extract enough water if you only had energy using sorption technologies and things like that. So what I knew was, you give me clean energy, I can give you clean air and clean water anywhere you want. So of those three things, the picking order was clean energy. So I said, that's a great place to go innovate, solve, do what we needed to do. But how do we do it? I can do some you know, like academic research on that. But it seemed to me, uh, and I'll get to why, looking at, at that time, this is late 90s, for at least 20 years starting late 80s, uh, early 80s, about 40 to 50 million people every single year were coming from abject poverty to lower middle class. And when that happens, 
their energy use goes up about thousand times what it used to be. And you do that for another 30 years, 40 years, and you want to do that. I mean, you don't want to bring all these people on the planet and have them be the, you know, abject poverty. That's a good thing. But the repercussions of that, if we just continued life as we know it, uh, energy as we know it, water as we know it, was unsustainable. That was very clear. So it didn't seem like academic research doing that alone would help go make an impact. So I wanted to do, do something more. The more I started reading about this, learning about it, the more the passion element kept going up saying, something has to be done about this now. And this is, this is before Al Gore put his PowerPoint, before you know, climate change, global warming became uh, common in everybody's lexicon. So forget all that for a moment. A planet where one in four people today don't have, you know, one in four uh, of our fellow human beings on this planet will not have access to a grid, clean electricity, clean water, go straight to health, right? I mean, clean, uh, not having access to clean water is one of the biggest sources of most of the illnesses and the, you, know, you know, deaths that we see. So um, what became clear to me is more has to be done. Then the next thing was I could start a company, right, you know, uh, try and get government funded research, bootstrap it and go where we needed to go. But I knew that the scale of the problem and the uncertainty of government funding in cycles will not allow for you to build a great company to do that. Then the next choice was I was advising a lot of large companies and that will go into some of the issues of how to do the transition and what is unique. Then the issue was I can go to very large corporations and I was advising many of them, competing with many of them depending on what I was doing, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, General Electric, uh, who are already in the space and ask them to create a separate department and I can run that and try to make a difference of something new. Um, but it was obvious from, for me from having competed with them and worked with them in certain areas that that kind of innovation can never happen in that kind of environment. And I can go into that later in Q&A if you're interested on why large companies never innovate the disruptive product coming out of there even though they have all the necessary wherewithal, including knowledge and intellect and people and resources, a lot more than an entrepreneur does, that just cannot happen. And we can talk about this. And it, it can be controversial, but that's really how it's happened. You know, the most disruptive product has never come out of an incumbent industry that's already a leader in the field. They may be a strong second follower and ultimately beat that little company in the marketplace. That's possible. In some cases, it's, it's not been, but it's never happened, okay? AT&T did not bring you the mobile phone. But AT&T today plays in the mobile phone market in a different way, as an example. Uh, so that's what led to Boom. Uh, so let me focus on a few things out here. So people asked about the transition. Was it hard to make? And June had asked me, challenge this group to think differently. So let's talk about this. Uh, I was not independently wealthy. When I decided to quit my tenured faculty position, I didn't take a sabbatical. I didn't do anything. Once I made the decision that it's uh, of all the options now, I'm going to go to venture capitalists, ask them to fund me and get this company started. As most of you know in this room, your first funding is for 12 months, 18 months, something of that run rate. Nothing else is guaranteed, so you're walking away from a tenured faculty position. And my university was asking, why wouldn't you take a sabbatical and do it? Uh, and we're willing to extend that by another year if you want to just stay. And for me, it was about, it was about burning the board when, you, when I made that decision that this is what I wanted to focus on. And uh, it's, it's not an easy decision till I got to that decision. 
But once I made the decision, I've never looked back. There was not a single night that I went back and said, did I do this right or wrong? Uh, but in making that decision, it's very important to have your significant other who is very supportive of you. <laughs> okay. In this case, my wife just looked at me and asked me a couple questions, and that's what I'm going to challenge you with if you're all in that boat thinking about it. She just asked me, so is your tenure in that university and your ability to get there a total chance and fluke and luck, or can you replicate it? Would somebody else want you if you just give that away? Do you believe in yourself or you don't? Was the question, right? If you do, what's the downside risk? Okay, what are you holding on to? Those are important questions. Right? Each one of us will make very different decisions on this, but it's important to challenge ourselves to ask, what is the fear that's holding us back again to go reach our aspirations, to go after our aspirations? And what is the worst thing that can happen if that fear manifests itself? You'll find it very liberating if you go through that exercise. So for this group, the one thing that I can say in that whole area is to think that way. Okay. And you, you may come completely to the opposite conclusion that I came to, not, for, not in answering that question, but as you put your fears and where you are and think about it. But at least you have thought through that and made a thoughtful decision of being rational and not let your emotional fear inhibit you from even thinking through that and making the right decision. There's no right or wrong decision. Each one of us has to make that decision, right? But that helps. The, uh, and the other thing is, if I didn't do what I wanted to do, would I regret it when I'm much older? Was the other question for me. My internal question was that. And for me, it was very clear the answer was yes. And I didn't want to have a life with regrets. There was no guarantee that anything that I was going to try was going to succeed. So going into legacy and why to make that happen and how to see that switch, what, what did we want to think? The concept was very, very simple at the end of the day. The concept was as long as mainframe computers existed, very large monolithic centralized computing connected with wires to dumb terminals. Very few people had access to computing. Those very limited applications that computing was applied to. You all know that, many of you know that. Okay. The moment computing was distributed, you go even to laptops, desktops, it created access. Uh, most of the emerging economies that are now the back offices in terms of software support to the emerged economies would not even know how to do computing, you know, you know, computer programming and how to get that right if they didn't have access to distributed computing. Most of the things we do today with computing will not have happened without that break from centralized to distributed. The second thing that'll, that happens when you go from centralized to distributed is you personalize it. Nobody can ever tell me that their deck terminal that was sitting there and blinking that cursor you had any emotional attachment to. Okay? Your, your iPad, your, your stuff. You have attachment to it because it's your music, it's your programs, it's your whatever, right? If you're an architect, if you're an engineer, if you're a biotechnologist, you will have different things in there. You personalize it. The ability to personalize when it's distributed, one size fits all when it's centralized. Having explained that, the exact same analog applies to computing, uh, to uh, communications. 
Remember the landline telephone with the copper wires, the central exchange, AT&T, can I help you? So uh, that, that, from the time of Alexander Graham Bell to today, there are 21 landlines for every 100 people on the planet. Okay? That was the peak, and that, that'll be the peak, and, you know, we've already hit peak, and it's going down. That didn't mean that 21 people on the planet had access to it. Office phones, multiple phones in rich homes, all that kind of stuff. Over a 100-year period, that's what we had. 20 years of cell phones, there were 99 cell phones on the planet for 100 people on the planet. Again, not 100 people, uh, not 99 people have it, but pretty darn close. Okay? Access. If, if access is what is important, centralized to personalized, centralized to distributed. So the simple question was, isn't, if that's what the market has already shown, is necessary for access. To me, centralized grid with centralized power stations telling me when I can turn my washing machine on and what, char what they'll charge me when I do. That's control, you know, centralized command control. That's communism. Okay? Distributed is true democracy. So you provide, if you're in the middle of Africa, a little box. It's not the corrupt government that's sitting in that capital of that country that's going to tell a citizen when the, whether they're going to have power or where there is going to be power and when and how much it's going to cost. That's access. That's democracy. That's true democracy. And in today's world, without electricity, nothing else is a stepping stone to progress in life. Right. So it's that fundamental concept. And there, I'm going to bring in another thing that will relate to. So the only risk, people say entrepreneurs are risk takers. And I want to break that first misnomer, okay? The risk that we take is this faith and belief that for 100 years we have done it this way. I truly believe that there's a better way. And this strong conviction, this passion, you're fanatical about it. Let the whole world tell you that, no, that's not how it is. You, you, you know it. You've seen it. You know, you've seen it in your mind's eye. And you believe in it, and you know that that will happen in each, one, in each one of your cases and whatever you're working on. That is the only risk that you take. After that, if you're a real entrepreneur who's going to succeed, Nothing else you do from that step on towards marching to that goal, do you take any risk. In fact, you're the best risk mitigator. If you look at the most successful entrepreneurs building a large, big company, you constantly obsess and assess of the 10 things that can kill you today. Every single day is an existential threat. When you're living that that way, you can see even in the animal world, you have heightened uh, alarms and alerts around you. That's, you know, that's, you are the little gazelle in Africa in the forest, okay? Uh, don't, not knowing who's going to pounce on you. Everybody, you know, everybody seems like a, you know, predator to you. So you're going to build, so you're paranoid, but you're paranoid in terms of saying, what are the risks? How am I going to build, build walls around those risks to make sure that I can mitigate it, eliminate it as quickly as possible? So that's a very important step, no matter what you do, right? Uh, so uh, when, you, when you do that, so the first part that I've talked to you about really is Impact and significance. Be sure that you're extremely passionate about the what. If you're not, please don't start something. It is a painful roller coaster. It'll be ups and downs. What, what gets written about is all the glory stuff. Okay? Uh, that's, that's a summary. That's a, that's a highlight film. Okay? The grinding that happens 
on a daily basis, the meat grinder. Uh, that never gets written up. And you cannot endure that if you're not passionate about it. And I think it's hard for you to sustain it if you didn't believe in the significance and impact being so much larger than you. So that's the part on the impact uh, I want to talk. That's the what. Now let's, you know, let me get to the who. Once you have that what well defined, it's all about building a team. At that point, this idea is so big, you are just a cog in the wheel. You may be a founder, it may be your, it may be your original idea, but it's no longer yours. It's a much larger, it's a much larger mission. It truly has to be a mission. And the team that you're going to hire under you, the who, become missionaries in that process. You, you will still be viewed by them as your leader, but you cannot view this as your mission. It is a larger mission that you are a part of. Uh, when, you, when you do that, it helps one of the questions that Kurt asked. There's a heck of a lot that you don't know, especially a, a academic going into the stuff. I mean, I'd never seen a balance sheet. I never understood a balance sheet. Uh, uh, you know, as an academic, you're always a cost center. There's no profit, right? I mean, you just, you just take money and you spend it. And, you know, uh, that's all you got to manage. Uh, I didn't understand a balance sheet. I didn't, uh, you know, quite care for a while that I needed to understand a balance sheet. But I knew that that's something I don't know, but that's very important for business. So that self-awareness and the humility to know what you don't know. And building that team of bringing people in who can educate you. Okay, uh, Building that team and the question got asked, the transition from a small, from being small all the way to building a, you know, building a large company. Uh, when do you lay the foundation for that from the very beginning? You cannot halfway through in creating an institution change its thinking, change its culture. You can. It is a lot harder and it never works well. From day one, dress up for who you want to be. Okay? Create the culture that you want to have from day one. What are the common mistakes we can make? You know, five of the people around you uh, were with you in the early days. The six of you are starting the company. Uh, everybody has a title that has a C attached to it. Chief something, chief something, chief something. Guess what? That's a disaster waiting to happen. Because if your vision is to have a 5,000 people company, are these the people that are all going to be at the top and everybody you're going to hire from outside, you know, be, you know, people that work with you in the same ecosystem? No. So for the first hundred people that we hired in the company, we all had one title. It said member of technical staff, including me. None of us had a title. Okay, no, no entitlements. We're, we're all going to earn what we needed to do. So when, when I went to Kleiner Perkins and said, do you want to be the CEO? I said, you better believe it. Every day I'm going to come and try to earn that job. But the day I'm not earning my job, you should kick me out and put somebody else in because the mission is bigger. And, and to this day, it's not an entitlement to me. Uh, every single day I have to earn that job. That's, that's how I come into work in the morning. So building that team and then setting the culture. On setting the culture, what I would say is uh, no prima donnas. Okay, we, we had a situation that I can share with you. Uh, our very first deliverable was due within two months. We were eight months into the company. Very big step for the next level of funding. Basically, oxygen being cut off or left on, right? That's what it is in these companies. Uh, and um, one of the key designers who was responsible for everything uh, came and uh, 
could not get along with the rest of the team. He was fantastic. He was phenomenal. But wanted to dictate everything and the other 15 people at that time, it was a 16 people company, could not get along with him. They came to me one day and said, you've tried many things, but we are here to tell you that it's either him or us. Uh, it's not going to go forward very fast. And they thought it's a very difficult decision for me. So I just brought that guy in and asked him, I've known you for a long time, you're doing fantastic work. This cannot be. What is it? And he felt very clearly that he, he knew his importance. He said, no, this is how it's going to be, otherwise I'm walking out. And my team almost fell to the floor when I said, in that case, please walk out. And they all looked at me and said, after he walked out, do you know what you did? I know that we can pull this off. I said, guys, you all wanted to be a team? Step up. We're going to get this done without that person. Because you can never build a company if in the early stages you set any one person to be indispensable. We all know of plenty of indispensable people in every cemetery. Okay, life goes on. All right. Um, so uh, that's the who. Uh, I'll just, I'm just looking at time. Let me t touch one more topic. And uh, then the how, right? The how gets into culture building, which again is very common no matter what field you're in. And uh, you have to set a culture from day one. Uh, I just explained to you the no prima donna uh, as part of it, treating each other with respect. And again, don't try to copy somebody else's culture. It'll never work. Uh, culture cannot be, culture has to be pervasive but it cannot be incongruent to the leader. They are not going to do the posters that you put out and your consultants come and tell you this is what it's got to look like. They are going to act the way you act. So you have to live, breathe, and do everything in the culture 24-7, 365 that you're asking people to do. In fact, they're going to emulate your behavior and not what you write. And Culture and good values are wonderful and easy to do when everything is going well. Can you stick with it when your back's against the wall? That's, that's the real test. And if you as a leader cannot do that, you can't ask for a culture that's different than you. So don't try to copy somebody else's culture, but understand it's important and create your own culture. Um, funding. Look, there is always funding. The question is, what's your idea? My first funding came in 2001. It was a nuclear winter for startups. Dot-com bubble had just burst. Kleiner Perkins, that typically would do 30 to 40 investments a year, did two investments that year. And they'd never invested in the energy space. They invested in us. We did a huge fundraising during the 2008 meltdown when the Dow Jones Industrial was at 6,000 at an up round. Uh, if you want big funding, think big. Uh, with that, I'll just stop. And I don't know if, if you're out of time or you want me to take yeah, questions. Two minutes for questions. Okay, questions. I, I love your example on uh, how uh, Kleiner Perkins invested in you and you Yeah, so, so look, accessible power in so many different ways is a, is a non-issue. Uh, the amount of time I've spoken to you, from the time I came to now, it's about an hour, we would, we would have had enough solar irradiation on the planet if we could capture everything to power the entire planet at today's level for about nine months. So it's not a zero-sum game. I'm, and I'm not telling you that you can capture every photon. We know we can't. Uh, that's not the point I'm trying to make. 
in a 10 billion people planet, the amount of food waste, animal waste, human waste, and the biomass to biogas to what that can do, converting what would otherwise be a waste problem into energy and eliminating the waste problem in a very nice way. Uh, because you're only taking the volatiles away. The uh, other content can still be used in so many other ways. Uh, so the issue with energy is purely affordability. Can you bring a new technology that makes power affordable? Can you bring a new technology that can make it accessible? Uh, why would you run thousand miles of transmission distribution lines to power a village of thousand people in Africa that can barely afford to pay. Economically, you will never do that. That would simply mean that these thousand people, if they need a better life, have to move to a city or continue to live in poverty without, need, with, without having access. So you know that the old model cannot work. So you, so you're, you know, you have to think about it differently. So it's access and affordability. Uh, it's not a zero-sum game. You know, we don't have to worry about the zero-sum game here because energy is ubiquitous. But how do you make it sustainable along the way, right? Otherwise, we'll not have a planet to live on. So yeah. it's clean. Yeah, it is, it, is a, it is a difficult issue of in the, in the energy space and I'll be stretching myself but maybe uh, you, know, you can educate me afterwards on the healthcare space uh, if I'm wrong. Uh, the issue is providing the right market incentives and rate design that incentivizes the big players in the industry to do the right thing. When the incentive is misaligned to the goals of what is good, what is good in the long run from a human perspective, all sorts of chaos happens. And that's exactly where the energy world is. And my suspicion is it's not significantly different in your space. Just looking at it, from the little reports in Wall Street Journal and things that I read. Uh, how do you, for us it's rate design. How do you create the rate design in a way that incentivizes the right behavior? In your case, it's the same market signals of where is the pricing. Industry is going to do to, op to optimize and maximize that equation. But if, if we figure out a clever way of that optimization and maximization, also maximizing benefit and significance and impact, then things work better. And it's, it'll, it'll always be a game. And uh, so we need a fluid structure that adjusts with the times. Uh, that's true with financial you know, you know, incentives. It's true with you know, the financial industry, health industry, our industry. David. Uh, you you always need both, right? Uh, you need a you need a combination of the two. But my philosophy on hiring is just so you know, I spend at least uh, forty percent of my time in recruiting and retention. I think that's one of my primary jobs as a CEO. Until we were thousand people, I interviewed every single candidate, no matter what they did. And by that time, as, as you would imagine, uh, people were a lot more qualified to interview a candidate for their particular field than I ever would be. The only thing I did there was check on the culture fit. Within, I can talk to somebody for 10 minutes and get to the culture fit. That, you know, kind of honed my radar for that. So that's what I did. But to go back to your question on general athlete, I come from the school of Jim Collins, 
of you look at people and say, are they, are they the right people to be on the bus? Okay? Once you get them on the bus, which seat they go sit in can get sorted out. And, and many times, having the right person sit in the wrong seat is a problem. And constantly, once they have come in, adjusting the seating becomes extremely important. Uh, but I'm a big believer in great athletes coming in. If you find them, get them in the bus. Uh, you will need more people than you think you would need. And uh, George Schultz has a very good thing. If you want them during the you know, like landing, make sure you have them during the takeoff. <laughs> okay? It, it's, it's, like, it's like common sense, but it's so true. And so bringing these people, and that has two different significance, bringing them at the right time, but also getting buy-in, explaining what you do, uh, and getting the buy-in so they will be with you in the journey, you know, through the journey, so you can land where you want to land. Thank you so much, Thank you. Pierre.